Welcome to the Property Management Mastermind Show with your host, Brad Larson. Brad owns one of the fastest growing property management companies in San Antonio, Texas. This podcast is for property managers by property managers. You'll hear from industry leading professionals on best practices, new ideas, success stories, and lessons learned. This is your opportunity to learn about the latest industry buzz surrounding property management, as well as tips and strategies to improve your business. Now here's your host, Brad Larson. Today's show is sponsored by the National Property Management Network, providing insurance products and services to property managers such as tenant liability insurance. Visit them at nationalpropertymanagement.com. And Jason, thanks for joining us here in studio for another episode of the Property Management Mastermind Show. How are you doing today? Doing good. Good drive over and just really appreciate you having me. It's such an honor just to sit and visit for a minute. Jason, appreciate you coming over. A uh, lot to talk about. You and I were talking before the show started. I uh, have a good intro for you that everyone just heard. So kind of give us some background to kind of why you're here, what you've been doing. Uh, so people kind of know who you are from your perspective. Awesome. Yeah, we... Um... We are AccuTrack Background Screening. I've been with that company since 2008. Um, Jeannie Baker's the owner. She founded the company in 1998. She worked at the credit bureau before that and seen a need, kept getting calls from landlords. So that's how it kind of evolved. Um, we started back when this thing was fax machines and phone calls. So um, <laughs> as technology's evolved, you know, we tried to evolve with it and stay, stay relevant. And luckily, we've been able to build a, a really good brand. Um, just focus on integrity, focus on the customers, but anything under the ten, tenant screening or employment screening realm, that's where we're going to, um, that's where we're going to come in strong. And that, that entails multifamily, single family, and then the employment screening is actually a pretty neat feature as well. I don't yes. think a lot of people use that as they should. Yeah. In the tenant screening world, people don't realize they're not supposed to run their employees through their tenant screening software. <laughs> um, that's, but that may be a whole different podcast, yeah. but yeah, the, Anything under that umbrella, we're going to be able to cover. Um, something that we've also moved into, uh, home-based landlords. There's so many people that try to do this on their own. And so there's a few platforms out there now. We, we launched one at TenantScreeningSolutions.com that's solely based for home-based landlords. Um, so really anything under that umbrella, um, we're able to cover. And, of course, for you guys, we always try to push them into doing business with a property manager that's involved in the meetings and knows what's going on. That's a big deal because let's talk about some of this. This is really why I brought you in so we can talk about some of the the pitfalls and the the things that are going to be problematic for other property management company owners when they set up their screening procedures. So you are considerably the subject matter expert in this field. Been doing it a while now. Yeah. We've seen a little bit of everything and, and we know applicants will lie. Of course. Uh, I think they call it omissions, yes. right? Isn't that the politically correct <laughs> yes. term? It's commissions and omissions. And o- yes. Yeah, they, they forgot to tell you about the three other families they wanted to move into the home. Right. You know, they forgot to tell you they had a few other things. Yeah, their boyfriend their gets out of prison in two weeks. Uh. Yeah, that, those types of scary <laughs> things. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, we see it all the time. Everybody sees it. It's just one of those things that's never a perfect animal. Right. But with good screening solutions in the forefront of your leasing process, it does offer that good funnel to where at the bottom of that funnel, you're hopefully going to be leasing it to folks that are really decently qualified and can be the right. top, top of the, the market out there. Right. Yeah. When you're qualifying tenants, um, I, we see a lot of even property management companies, uh, but especially in the, the home based realm. I mean, we just see so many people that want to go by their gut feeling and don't understand what they're doing. You know, if they bought a house to as an investment, you guys see it all the time. That's probably going to be the biggest investment they will make in their in their life on earth. I mean, mm-hmm. that much money trying to get a return on it, and they're going with their gut feeling. You know, it just – so especially when we run across property management companies that have a, a really poor source in place or sometimes they're, they're using a $2 search on, mm-hmm. you know, something they found on the Internet, and they're managing that property for somebody else. And here's, so, a, here's a good story along those lines. So – my director of leasing, Andrea, went to a designation course a couple weeks ago, mm-hmm. and there were several other uh, San Antonio-based property managers, and I'm using air quotes for the audience, right. property managers. <laughs> and one of the ladies in that class said they approve applicants depending on how they feel about them. <laughs> yeah, you better <laughs> have Andrea something on was paper. Like, Andrea's hair was on fire. She was ducking under the table. She's like, you can't do that. You can't <laughs> do this. So that's what we see out there, and you're, that's exactly to your point. Let me tell you how 
when it really set in for me, there's so many landlord associations. I'm sure you guys have a ton in San Antonio. Well, we have a bunch in Houston too. And uh, so I seen this email come through for this landlord meeting and I thought, I'm gonna go check it out and see what these guys are about. And uh, I got an opportunity to speak mm -hmm. and there wasn't a whole lot of people there. You know, it was maybe 15 of us. Um, and then, so I got up and spoke in front of them and going through the processes of what we do and why we do it, you know, we got to the adverse action part. And of course, the whole time they've been kind of laughing at some of the stuff I'm saying, I can feel it, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, we get to the adverse action part and the president of the association says, we don't even need to cover that. Of course, me, I'm saying, well, why do you, what do you mean we don't need to cover that? And he said, well, we basically, all of us, when we get somebody we don't like, we just tear that application up and pretend like they never applied. <laughs> At that point, I knew right then that I wasn't going to hand out any cards afterwards. Uh -huh. and, and I could tell by the way they were snickering and being like, yeah, we don't do that. You know, and it's like, wow. these. And I really learned the difference in one meeting mm -hmm. of a slumlord and the people that do it right, like our NARPA members. Yeah. Um, the integrity, doing things correctly, because guaranteed they're going to get sued. If they haven't been, I, I can almost assure you some of them in that group had been sued, mm -hmm. and the rest of them will be at some point, the way the laws are changing. Rental property is not like it used to be. And I hear that from people that are have owned a home for 10 years, yeah. and now they have to go through an online application. And, uh, you know, especially our, our elderly community, they're saying this stuff used to be done with a handshake. You know, now i got to get my grandkids involved. It is. It's a different process. And uh, that process is designed for the property manager to help that owner get a return on the investment. So yeah. they, it, get, it goes so deep, we're just flabbergasted sometimes. I want to talk more about the intricacies of the application process. I mean, the screening side. So let's talk about what you guys do a little bit, but let's talk about some of the application stuff that's really got to be paid attention to. The big hot topics right now, as you and I discussed already, are going to be animals, are going to be felons, they're going to be credit score based decisions, right. all these things. Let's talk about that. And then we can talk about that, uh, that, that letter at the end that we talk about, that nasty gram that you got to send out yes. to those tenants. Yes. So the main thing, you know, right now, the best thing you can do, and if the application providers aren't doing this, they're lacking. You need to be able to tell that tenant up front what you're looking for. Okay, um, it, it helps everybody, you know, it yeah. helps them understand, should I even apply for this property, you know, establishing good yeah. screening yeah. criteria. If, if it's mm -hmm. $2,500 a month rent and you can tell by the criteria that you do not qualify, you're, you're saving everybody's time. So mm -hmm. just by having that up there, not to mention it discloses everything, yeah. you know, there's nothing left on the table. Um, I can tell you that right now that's lacking in a lot of management companies is their screening criteria is not really posted as well as it should be. Right. I mean, it might be internally to them, but for example, we post everything to the multiple listing service. So as soon as an applicant sees, they can see our screening criteria. It's posted on our website. It's the very first thing right. in the application process. They have to go through the screening criteria and, and read it. So we're doing that. I'm pretty confident that we're doing the right thing, but there's always room yes. for improvement. But you're saying that people aren't even putting that out there or don't even have screening criteria? Yeah, yeah. you'll have a page that says, welcome, enter your name, and then you can enter into the application. So they're going in kind of blind. Um, the other side of that is, you know, especially here in Texas, you know, I always encourage people to put the information about brokered services mm -hmm. on their application or at least link to it. Um, so there's a lot of things that the application softwares, that they're, they're, they do a lot of things based on volume, you know, and the single family industry may not be as huge a volume for them to implement some of these things, but it's going to help their, their people. It's going to help people stay in compliance, stay out of trouble. Um, the disclosure on the application too, you know, the disclosure for the background check. Right. The most important part of the process really that that person knows they're being screened and they know that they're going to see a hit on their credit report. Um, and us doing, being a third party provider for, you know, over 1500 landlords, we get calls daily. Why is AccuTrack on my credit report? <laughs> and it's like, well, we're, what town are you in? Okay, do you, did you use this property manager? And we break it down and, and we can usually tell them right away, okay, this person is the one that ran your credit and then they're good and go on. But people want to know that their credit's gonna be ran when it's hit. Um, they wanna know what you're looking for. But yeah, to get that disclosure, and like we talked about uh, before, you know, there's places you know, New York, California, well, California, especially, you know, in our industry, it's really 40, 49 states plus California when it comes to compliance, whether that's mm -hmm. employment, tenant screening, whatever. Um, but different things, where's that applicant coming from? So all these things have to be taken into account and having something as simple as the, the disclosure for the California applicant coming to San Antonio on work. Now they've checked that box and you're in compliance. Mm -hmm. um, so different things like that, that the, the 
landlords really shouldn't have, you know, they should have somebody in place that's helping them keep up with this. You guys have enough on the compliance side. But um, yeah, so hopefully the softwares are allowing for some of that stuff. That's really in a, in a technology driven age, you know, paper applications, handshakes, that stuff just doesn't work anymore. People can be anybody. They'll, they can put anything down on there and it needs to be verifiable. So probably one of the things that we should touch on, and this is, this is stuff that keeps me awake at night, is declining applicants. So when the need arises to decline an applicant, there's certain things that we can't or, or have a hard time declining them for. So let's talk through that. So let's say credit. I mean, credit could be one as long as it's disclosed, right, correct? Right. And you can go back to them and there's a letter of declination or you call it an adverse action letter. Yes. Uh, you can call it any 10 different things. It's essentially the same thing. You're going to check a box that says credit insufficient or insufficient credit or something along those lines. Right. So that, that's an easy one to do because it's cut and dry pretty much. Not necessarily. Okay. The, the credit side. So what we're seeing now, and there's still a lot of gray area here, um, a lot of landlords, and we're having to go back to our clients right now too. I mean, we're still gathering information based on this, but a lot of people say, for instance, we fell below a 550 credit score. That could get somebody in trouble. They're saying now they don't want you to deny based solely on the credit score. So not a, not a huge problem. So now the adverse action letter should say denied based on credit delinquencies. Mm -hmm. Now the score's not an issue. You had prior delinquencies on your credit report, and that's why we denied you. So whether you had a 480 credit score or a 650 credit score, we've seen some delinquencies that concerned us. Um, now that's a key point. Let's not brush over that, because I always like to reiterate points that are hugely important. That's one of them. So instead of denying for the credit score, you say denied from credit delinquencies. Right. That's yeah. important. That's yeah, a big deal. I hope everybody catch that. And uh, the adverse action side of things, I mean, we could spend a whole podcast just on that. And really, when I'm talking to property managers, I'll kind of throw that out there just in, in discussion. You know, well, what are you currently doing for adverse action? And do you know three or a quarter of them will come back and say, what's adverse action? And right then, I know I'm dealing with somebody that's not that educated in the process and probably really should let us come on board and help with the background screening. Because mm -hmm. if they don't know that term, then right now they're, they're open to get sued. Yeah. And it's things that we talk about. Um, you know, people getting sued, land, landlords getting sued. A lot of this stuff, the average person may not know about, you know. So, yeah, you can roll the dice on some things. But in today's age, what, what we're finding, you really need to know your side of the stuff as a landlord, as the property manager, because these applicants, these tenants, they've got the same Google we have. Sure. And they know their rights. And if you get an applicant that his uncle is one of the best lawyers in San Antonio, and you forget to give him the adverse action letter when he's denied, you're opening yourself up for a whole can of worms or you do something wrong in that process of denying them. Um, for instance, I hear you guys talk so much about the, uh, the animals, mm -hmm. service animals, huge topic of discussion right now. I hear it all the time. Well, we got a call from one of our landlords. Actually, it just came up in discussion while we were talking about the tenant screening stuff. But um, they got sued for $13,500 because they had three applicants one of them had a service dog, and the other two didn't have animals. And so they told her, we aren't, we, we're going to rent to one of the people without animals, and didn't even take her service dog into account. And so she sued them. Um, she had a pretty decent case. They weren't sure, so they went ahead and settled for two grand on the day of court sure. and got out of it. But it, it was so, you know. So in that example, what they did wrong is they incorrectly worded an adverse action attempt. They didn't even give her. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the things that we were like, well, what documentation did you give her? Mm -hmm. um, the home-based landlords, you know, that was one of the, when we see this stuff, it, it's a really, it's a pain point for us because we work with people like, you know, our NARPA members, um, we see them doing this properly and we see you guys getting the owners a return on their investment or talking them through the investment, just like mm -hmm. uh, the, was it the previous podcast you were talking about depreciation. Right. Things that the owners are leaving out of their equation and um, so, yeah, that side of things, to avoid it all, you know, to let it, you could really just let a third party unbiased source handle that. We provide the letters. Um, That's get, an intangible that a lot of do-it-yourself landlords, you call them home-based DIY landlords, they forget about why they hire a management company because most good management companies put these issues into place. It's a good tenant screening process, right. a good adverse action process, 
into place to where it's a regimented routine thing and right. documented. Right. So when you turn down that applicant because of whatever reason, it's done correctly and it's done with a proper documentation. Let's not forget about the documentation side. Right. So touch on that for me, just so you kind of, you know, cover now, the base. Documentation as far as the letter that's sent yeah, out. Yeah, how it's sent out, make sure that the wording's so correct. And all that, that letter, uh, and this is a lot of things too, you know, the adverse action letter in nowadays, a lot of times in the past, we would send that for the property manager. Uh, Jeannie just, she took another trip to Washington this year and of course got, you know, scared everybody to death. Mm -hmm. But so the adverse action letter needs to come from the property manager, the person that's communicating with that applicant. But once you email it, so for instance, our clients, they went through the process, this applicant's denied, that adverse action letter is available in the system and for other CRAs, which is a consumer reporting agency, a background screening company like us, should be providing that letter for the sole purpose that if something's wrong on that background report, you have to give that applicant a chance to, to dispute that, yeah. you know, to say that's another James Smith. I'm not a sex offender, okay. you know, so you give them that. And that's the, so you, so the listeners know that's the whole reason behind the adverse action letter. So they have an opportunity to refute some of those. They have an opportunity to see why they were denied. Okay. There might be something totally wrong. And just to give you an example, um, about, well, it was when we went to buy our first house. So it would have been 10 years ago, roughly nine or 10 years ago. My wife and I went to buy a house and, and all this stuff's on my credit. And I'm like, this isn't mine. And the credit bureaus had switched my brother and I. Ah. So we had to spend time to get that cleaned up, write the letters. But you have to know if an applicant doesn't know, if you just you know email them and say, we're not, we're not renting to you, they have no idea why you made that decision. Mm -hmm. So that decision, should, you know, the, the CRA should be providing that letter. That letter should have their information on it. So our, our clients send that letter out. It has AccuTrax information. Now that client or that applicant can call us, ask for a copy of the report, and that's really the only time we give one is if they need to dispute it. Whole another thing there about who that credit report belongs to, which yeah. is the property manager. Um, but anyway, so that way they could call us. We have a dispute process on our website, so we know exactly what, what they're disputing. We can go through the motions and help them do that. So if your CRA, if your background screening company isn't going to bat for you like that, isn't offering support on the dispute side, um, really take a look at your processes and not even say AccuTrack, might, you know, we may not even be the best fit, but look for somebody that's covering those bases mm -hmm. um, for, for their applicants and for their clients. But that yeah. adverse action is so important. Let's kick around some of the things that we talked about earlier with, uh, we talked about risk mitigation, right? So one of the things that we want to touch on is that adverse action letter can tie into almost another offer, right? So we have a program, a couple of programs, and this is a smart thing to do is where you can do it via credit-based score, or if they have no credit, you can offer them an opportunity to rent one of your homes with basically, from what I understand, you turn them down, right. but in the same action, the same letter, you're giving them an opportunity to rent one of your homes at these different terms. Right. So talk me through some of that. Well, like we said a second ago, the, the credit score, just ba denying solely based on the credit score, the model that you're talking about in place is perfect you know, because it's giving them an opportunity. So, so say they do have a 412 credit score. Well, I now go that low, but we, you know, let's say they got a 550. <laughs> now you're, now you're giving them an opportunity. Well, even if it, it was that low as, as in your model, you're not saying you're denied based on that. You're saying, here's an opportunity. If you want to rent, we will make it available at a higher deposit. So mm -hmm. it's tiered. If I'm correct that, you know, this, this area is one deposit, this area is one deposit. And then if your credit's good, you're normal. Um, and so rather than just kicking them out and not even giving them an opportunity, like, like we talked, you know, if somebody's credit score is 550, now let's, we need to look at why that credit score Dig is deeper, 550. Right. You know, is it, do they have one trade line and that trade line is a medical bill that they, you know, times got hard and they were delinquent on it three times and that's their only trade line. We see that a lot, especially in younger kids, mm -hmm. you know, coming out of college or even the college community, um, they get four people together and rent a house next to campus, you know, um, they they definitely need to have an opportunity to rent without having you know if that's their only if that's their only uh, bad point mm -hmm. now you're giving them an opportunity so the discrimination factor isn't there and we're not discriminated against anybody your credit score is that way because you made it that way but yeah. I'm still I'm a nice guy I'm going to give you an opportunity to rent and yeah. so that really helps and now you you can go back to you're not doing anything you know, denial wise based on the credit score. Yeah, as long as you can charge enough or get enough deposit or right. charge enough fees to offset some of that risk to the landlord you're representing, 
I think it's all good. Right. Because the homes will rent quicker. Uh, they'll come to you with better opportunities. And so, for example, we do risk mitigation fees, and it's on a tiered level. And this is a big benefit to tenants in this market because you've heard the traditional two or three times deposit. Right. Or, you know, whatever state you're in, they might charge, uh, they might have a limit on deposits. Well, here in Texas, there's really no limit. So let's say they had a not so great credit score. You could charge a double deposit. But what does that equal? That could equal four grand or, or five right. grand. I mean, something out, outrageous uh, or even a triple deposit. But if there was a little bit of a risk mitigation fee in there that could offset that security deposit, bottom line is if you can get them into your home, cover yourself, cover right. your landlord, and make the cost of getting in, the barrier of renting lower, right. you're going to be able to rent homes faster and still provide a great service to everybody involved. Because we, we often get blinded by we represent the landlord, we represent the owner. Well, also, we have to look out for the tenant's best interest in some cases because right. You have the slumlords that say, no, I'm not going to fix air conditioning. I don't care if it's July. Let them fry. Right. And then we have to step in and, and make some decisions, you know. Yes. Uh, I know that's dramatic, but you kind of get my point. And totally. A lot of people out there listening will get that. Yeah. That's, and, uh, yeah. you know, with the the applicants, it really, it, it just gives them a whole, I say the applicants. Let me go back to the owners. Mm -hmm. How many owners are missing out on a great tenant because they've seen a 550 credit score and denied them. Yeah. When had they called the, the current landlord and the past landlord and found out that this person is model, man, they keep the house clean. They call me, they only call me, they call me one time when the roof caved in. Other than that, I never heard from yeah, them. Never you know? missed a payment. Never missed a rental payment. Yeah, left um, the home in good condition. Totally. References mm -hmm. checked out, you know, so there's so many landlords that are doing this for other people but aren't looking at the big picture. So if you're if you're screening on little things like that, mm -hmm. I just urge you to look at the big picture, and you may find a, a little gem in there. Like when we uh, the first house we bought in Arkansas, our neighbors at the time that we moved to Houston had been there eight years, and their credit was horrible. <laughs> you know, I and it, it was, and I told them I said, you guys are just hard renters to replace. You know, you, and they kept the place up. You know, they they treated it like it was theirs. I said, when you guys finally leave, man, your landlords are, are they're not going to replace somebody just like you guys. It just, you're far and few between. You yeah. Know? Yeah. They had an opportunity to rent and they made the best of it. Yes. So I, I agree with you there. Let's talk about uh, another hot topic is felons. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's talk about, you see an application, they have some sort of criminal history on there. Uh, let's talk me through what you know so the listeners can kind of get a feel for what's going on in the industry as far as screening, right. applications, and what it has to do with criminal. Well, Unfortunately, on the criminal side, you can't charge extra for your risk like no, you can I'm, on the yeah, credit score. I'm fine with that. I wish we could sometimes, but uh, but especially with some of the things HUD's doing right now, um, and for the ones that are tuned into NARPM, you know, you guys are hearing the buzz about this, and we actually have a big group that's going to Washington to talk with them, because what HUD has done is they've changed the guidelines. So in the past, you know, you're aware that most people's criteria said, you know, we don't rent to felons. Uh, we don't rent to, you know, th they had a list of things that they wouldn't rent to. Mm -hmm. HUD has come back and said, we're asking that you take into account and, and let, there are cases right now um, at the federal level, people are in trouble for this. Whoa. And that's what prompted them to take a trip and, go, and be like, you know, we're all at liability if these people are in trouble. Mm -hmm. Because in the past, you could say, we don't rent to felons, we don't rent to this, because it's not a protected class, of course. You know, sure. criminals, you did what you did, there's going to be consequences moving forward in life. They should make a, a not protected classes for like realtors and lawyers. <laughs> say, we're not renting to you, forget it. No, I'm and, just kidding, uh, I'm just kidding. And uh, so now what we're seeing is HUD is saying, you need to look at that criminal history. How long has it been since the offense? What type of offense was it? And is there a property, maybe not the one that they, they applied for, but maybe there's one out somewhere that you could place them in. Well, that's that puts you guys at a, at a disadvantage because that, now yeah. you're having to discriminate against people. That gives me the pucker factor because yeah. I don't know who to approve and who not to approve at this and, point. And if somebody's got criminal history, you know, as a property manager managing a home for somebody else, you place somebody in that neighborhood and they, they have a, a reoccurrence of whatever crime they committed 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. They're going to come back and go, who placed this person in that property? Well, yeah. didn't you run a background check? And you go, well, yeah, but HUD, HUD told me I that I, I needed to find somewhere for this sex offender rather than just right. deny them. So we're in a bad spot right now, and that's, right. that's part of what that NARPM committee is doing. They're going to go to HUD directly, and they're going to try and get some clarification. I think it's going to be clear as mud once they walk out of there. Right. They're not going to get any like hard, definitive, written description of 
what criminal offenses are good and what criminal offenses are bad. I mean, right. they're all bad, but my point is, you know, a marijuana offense from 15 years ago. Right. Okay. That's they not haven't the been the in world. any trouble since. Right. You right. know, other things just stick with people that. Yeah. And and I guess we should take that deeper. HUD is not trying to to make criminals a protected class. Um, for anybody that wants to look further into this, you can look into disparate impact, which our criminal system is definitely flawed. You know, we have a certain percentage of our population, and then we have a small percentage of those being, you know, African American, uh, Hispanic, whatever the case may be. But our prisons are filled with those demographics. It's it's so it's so misproportionate to when you look at the numbers that something definitely is wrong there. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to come back and, and give managers a way to fix this to say, hey, we realize our criminal system's flawed and we've been putting people in prison for crazy things all these years. So please take a look at that. You know, give this person a chance. If you have five applicants, don't let that marijuana charge be the only thing that kicks them out. You know, mm -hmm. it was from how long ago that haven't been in any trouble since. So now that, that's the pain point. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the solution. Back to that criteria. You're going to tell them up front on that first page, we are going to screen your criminal history. Okay. Your criminal history may be cause for denial. We you don't may have to say that again because that's pretty <laughs> darn good. I uh, mean, that really is simple. It, it, your criminal history may be cause for denial or something to that effect. You know, we will, um, criminal so history of, will be looked at on a case by case basis. So instead of a will be denied, maybe. Totally. Okay. And, and it's really funny. The only thing that HUD said you can say we, we absolutely deny for are the manufacturing and distribution of controlled substances. Not manufacturing. Of, and, and I learned this from Bart Sturzel um, at the last conference he spoke at. Mm -hmm. He really laid it out there. He's so in tune with this stuff that another reason for people to get involved with NARPM. I mean, we could sit here and go on all day. Yeah, for the folks that don't oh, know, my goodness. Bart is the, is the uh, past president of NARPM. He was the 20... 16 president, uh, still very active in making sure that NARPM gets in touch with HUD and all that. So continue on. So he, he really laid out, um, it's not just, um, you know, say they're, they're manufacturing drugs. You can't say we deny for manufacturing drugs. We, we deny all cases involved with manufacturing and distribution of controlled substances. Hmm. So with that one thing being, you know, rather than put, having to put that on there, just label it. You know, criminal history is looked at on a case by case basis. Um, you know, could be cause for denial. Yeah. That, that's it. And now you're looking, you're not putting a blanket statement out there. Really across the board, whether you're an employment tenant, healthcare, it don't matter. You know, mm -hmm. blanket policies are kind of going out the door. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you have a blanket policy on something, get with your legal counsel, look at that again. <laughs> Make sure you don't have anything that's discriminatory in there. Uh, but yeah, so the criminal side of things, you know, just be aware that just take a look at it, take into account, look mm -hmm. at the big picture. Um, yeah. So let's talk about the business side of this because uh, we've gone through all the application stuff and we wanted to really touch on the pain points. So AccuTrack is a business. So for those that don't know, it's an outsourced screening application solution. And I've talked about this many times where you kind of go up and down in the operational side as you grow within a management company. Uh, starting off as yourself, you're do-it-yourselfer. That's a perfect place to go out and get some outsourcing assistance because you're not going to have a full-time person in your office if you're just starting off a management company or you manage five homes or you're do-it-yourself five right. homes or you're managing, you know, 50 homes or 100 homes. And it's a great opportunity to, to, to look into an outsourced service like what you guys do. Right. And I think that's a perfect – I really want you to talk more about that because it's the business side of it that other people are going to be interested in as well. You bet. And you know – as well as I do in the last couple of years that looking at outsourcing has really been a hot topic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, being able to utilize somebody as an employee without having to pay all the federal, you know, things that go into hiring an employee. Yeah. What's your alternative cost? Hire an employee at right. 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars a year. Paying or, taxes, everything that correct. goes into that, you know, or you just pay for the, the application screening service at, at, a, at that time. And the best part is with a service like ours, you know, this is where, like you're saying, when we're talking, especially people that are talking or starting out or we're talking to real estate brokers, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of them don't want to mess with it because it, it can be a pain if they don't have the processes in place. And so it really provides just a third party source um, to take on some of the things that otherwise you may not have somebody in the office to do, mm -hmm. or maybe you want to free up some staff members. 
And um, so outsourcing, letting somebody else take care of those things um, have really, it's just taken off. And since 2000, we've been one of the homes of the pool verifications where we actually call landlords and employers and um, and put together that what we call the premium full verification report. Mm -hmm. um, but so that that side of it, allowing somebody to to manage the application, you know, you're getting rid of paper, which for you, especially in San Antonio, my goodness, you, I think everybody that moves here is relocating. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. So coming from somewhere else, they can't physically drive over to your office right. and get that paper application. It's military city, by the way. Lost, right. In case people don't know, we have three military bases here. <laughs> A lot of military flux, as we call it, incoming, outgoing. So we get a lot of people that apply for a home online, never see the home in person, roll in with a U-Haul, and then move into a home. Right. So sorry to, to derail you there. Oh, no. But, no problem, uh, no. One of the things that we want to talk about along those same lines is, you know, the, the, the credit application process is a business and the cost of it and kind of what you do from A to Z. And that's what I was going to – lost my train of thought there and got to rambling. But um, so the best part about it is that people forget – you can hire that employee for thirty or forty thousand to sit there and do this for you all day long, or you can charge your application fee to cover your cost. So you're that you're actually letting the applicant pay for this added third party source. You know, it's it's really genius. Um, and there are states I will disclose there are states, cities even you know different guidelines on what you can charge over your cost on the application fee. But you guys have time in office. We have time processing. So to charge, you know, a decent application fee covers that time. It covers that process. And then it's just taken care of. So mm -hmm. a lot of people forget that it's not even an expense. The applicant right. is going to cover that cost. And um, sometimes it's a moneymaker. Right. I mean, to be real honest with you, if you're charging X for an application and you guys you know, your cost is less than that. You can keep the profit. You still have to have somebody write that lease and do things after. Right. So it's, it's not, you know, so the application process is integrated right into their potential website. Not necessarily. Okay. Um, well, yes, there, we can integrate that right into their website. The software, I, I was thinking software there for a second. We, we are integrated with other softwares too, that allow for that seamless integration. Mm -hmm. Um, but as far as when somebody signs on and uses the AccuTrack application, I, I literally build that myself, and then we send them the link so that they can link to that application for their web from their website. They so can they embed would, it into their website. They can iframe okay. it. They can put an apply now button. Okay. Um, the options are there. So they just go to you know go to ABC Management Company website, whatever that could be. Hopefully, there's not an ABC company out there. I'm offending, <laughs> but we go to their website <laughs> and it clicks apply now, and they do everything straight into your software. Right. Okay. Right. Okay, that's yeah. Excellent. Usually they have a listing page or something, or even I'm seeing now um, a lot of you guys are, are being really smart and just having a whole page for tenant. Mm -hmm. Here's the criteria again before you even move into the application. You know all the, the everything that's going to be required if you are approved. Mm -hmm. um, and on that page with the listings and that information, they'll usually have an apply now button top and bottom or embedded in the listings. Um, it just depends on the the website and the provider, like property manager websites. Mm -hmm. Uh, those guys, their design work is, it's incredible too. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they're, they're really good. They'll just, you know, if somebody's working with them, we send them the link and they have, they have a process, they stick it right in there. It looks amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that's, that's what we want to make it as easy as possible for that applicant to apply. And just to give you an idea of the process, one of the things that sets us apart um, with larger companies, you, you turn into a number, you turn into an account. Um, one of the things that we do, myself and Sheila, uh, one of my coworkers, her and I handle all the application support. You were one of the first ones to ever see Quick Lease Pro. Um, <laughs> what's that been, six or seven years mm -hmm. ago now? And so over the course since it's been developed, I've been lucky enough to be right there beside them, see how this thing goes, in, you know, see how everything works on the back end. So early on, it was a no-brainer for our applicants that use the application. I can usually figure something out in two minutes mm -hmm. that everybody else is going to spend an hour or two days on. And I go in there, I can, I can usually look at it and know right away what the applicant's done. And as, as you move into technology, that's something that you have to take into account. Not everybody's computer is going to work. Not everybody's mobile device has the correct connectivity to be pushing these forms through in the way they load and things. Yeah. And so there's going to be some things there that you need that human interaction. And we, some, still, we still see people using paper applications oh my goodness. in today's world. So, so you get an online application mm -hmm. in, and then you guys do some additional steps along the same lines. You bet. So, I mean, there's going to be a filter at first. I mean, there could be like, okay, you have a X credit score below a certain threshold, you're automatically denied. 
Uh, so talk me through kind of the services you do once you get an application in. You bet. So the way we like to, to coach our, our clients to setting this up, first come, first serve basis is really the most ethical way to do it. Um, some people, you, depending on what state you're in, you still have the right to take five applications and pick the best one. What happens is, is the ones that weren't picked and didn't have anything wrong with their background, now they're going on Yelp and Yahoo sure. and going, they took my $75, I wasn't even up to rent the property. Right. So say that you post a listing on Friday, you get five applications for that listing. The first complete one that comes through, you've got their driver's license, paycheck stubs, they've done everything you asked them to do, push it through. If they're approved, great. So once we they push them through to us, we, we automatically run the credit, the criminal, and the eviction report. Okay. Um, and then along with that, we run the current landlord. When I say we run, we actually physically call the current landlord, the prior landlord, and the employer. Um, and we do a couple of other steps too, as far as, uh, for the ones that request it, we will look up tax records and things of that nature. Um, you know, added, added things in there that really help solidify that process. But so all of those things put together, you can really get a good snapshot. And as the property manager, from the time the applicant applied, you literally had to do nothing. You mm -hmm. know, the applicant hits your website. If they have problems, they call my cell phone or they call Sheila and we help them through it. We do the background check. And then so you basically get that completed email that says, you know, John Doe is complete. Now you get to make a decision. Okay. And um, going back to the criminal history side of it, that's one of the people think a lot of times there's one place to go get the criminal history. You know, maybe it's tied to your social security number, driver's license number. So off base, it's not even funny. Our, mm -hmm. our government hasn't really set up a good system. So the NCIC, which is the National Crime Information Center, uh, police officers and firemen and federal agents are really the only ones that are allowed to access that system. So the most complete system we have, they won't let anybody access it. <laughs> So now you've got developers all over the country, and this has been going on for 20 years now, that try to scrape that information from the county courthouses. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, scraping, it's one thing. You can scrape that information and put it in a database, and it's there. People search, they might find something. But to keep those databases updated on a consistent basis, now we're talking a, a big, now we're in a bigger ball game. And there's only about three or four people, three or four developers that have the systems designed to keep those updated. Um, out of those, we tested all of them, and we've got, we believe, the top in the country. That's why if you ever hear me at NARPM conferences saying, I would love to do a drag race with criminal history on everybody in here because I'm almost certain they're not using our provider because our provider came on the scene a little bit late and the relationships were in place. And so Jeannie, our owner, you know how uh, adamant she is when she needs something. Mm -hmm. She told our platform, and you know, she told them, I have to have these guys. I've tested it. I know they're they're blowing everybody out of the water on keeping these records updated, so that's how when I'm when I'm so confident that our criminal mm -hmm. data is off the charts that that's why you know we've done our our due diligence. I think everyone will look at that whatever screening source they're using, if any, they're going to start to look at that <laughs> criminal check a little bit with a raised eyebrow now. So I wonder who they're doing that with. The other thing, if somebody like say you get a let's just throw a name out there, Catherine Smith. Okay. Okay. Well, if you run Catherine Smith and don't find anything. There, there could be, a re and, and say she's got criminal history. Well, what if she's been married three times and has a maiden name? If you're not searching all of those names, you won't find anything under Katherine Johnson because she may have been Kat Johnson, Katie Johnson, under her married name or her, her maiden name three names ago. So Kat, Katie, Kathy, you know, all these different nicknames and alias names, we run them all. Even if it sounds weird, if we get on the social trace, if they send something back that says, you know, uh, Bob's nickname is Billy. You know, if it shows up on there, we're running, you know, Billy Bob Smith. It mm -hmm. just, we're going to run it just to be safe because there's so many ways to miss it. And so a lot of companies, something to beware of, always ask if they run alias names because it's, it's huge. The only ones that know this are the criminals. Yeah. <laughs> they, will, they will give you their middle name and last name and leave uh -huh. everything else off. So look at their driver's license when they send it. Match up those names. Match up the date of birth. Criminal history is only stored by name and date of birth. So okay. I could go on all day about that no, stuff. That's good but. advice. I didn't know anything <laughs> about that as far as how deep the criminal mm -hmm. history searches were. Uh, again, it's a little scary now. I'm starting to think about it. What are we missing? Yeah, you know? I mean, it's... 
Hmm. There's other places too, the federal level. You know, there hardly anybody in tenant screening runs the federal level. You're talking your bank robbers, your embezzlers, your uh, kidnappers, your drug traffickers across oh, state lines. They're really nice guys. <laughs> yeah. No, those are the ones we want. <laughs> the the wonderful, the ones you want for neighbors. Yeah, yeah, the, especially the, the kidnapping ones. <laughs> yeah, that's always a scary deal. But no, no joking aside, that's uh, that's great information, man. That's a that's a awesome stuff. So let let me give you a few minutes here to talk about your other cool ventures that you know a lot of people would be very that find very interesting talk to me about the bad tenant blues and then some of the stuff you're doing because you're a hell of a talented guy here this is pretty cool stuff <laughs> i i love to have fun even in the you know the course of chasing money and raising kids and doing everything in our daily lives um so i've always been a musician i've been lucky enough to be involved in in the music scene just just enough to go okay this is a cutthroat industry uh, but I've been able to take that knowledge. And so if you guys want to look us up, I work for AccuTrack. Um, it's hard to spell. It's A-C-U-T-R-A-Q. The easiest way to find us is to search the Bad Tenant Blues. So if you Google that or if you go to YouTube, you're going to find the Bad Tenant Blues and you're going to be able to see my name, Jason Wagner, AccuTrack, and see. Uh, and you're going to be able to, to find us, link to us, or just go to AccuTrack.com. But the, the Bad Tenant Blues was just a vision, just a, I, I wrote it on my lunch break one day mm -hmm. and then posted a little video and uh, it may be in three years, I think it had like 65, 66 hits, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I had the idea, I've always wanted to do an actual music video for it. Well, I've been, I've been in a lot of different music videos, uh, spent a lot of time, you know, in different places to watch people do this stuff and it's like, I know what to do. And so I called Kevin Knight one day and said, hey, Kevin, you want to be in a, in a music video? And so we planned it, came over, done all the filming and everything. So that's, you'll see him playing guitar. Yeah. You know, he just, <laughs> he, he played the air guitar for me. And, uh, but just such a fun project. And, you know, that's, that's really, those bad tenants are out there. Mm -hmm. And landlords, are, you know, if they stick in the game very long, they'll look like us with no hair yeah, pulling it out. Right. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, just a really fun idea. And so I think right now it's sitting at maybe 30,000 hits. And that's, I think we launched it in October before the National NARPA meeting. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, a little bit different feel to it. You know, I, I put some thought into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so really moving into, that actually sparked some other stuff where I'm, uh, Rob Ferrier over in Houston, if you go to his YouTube page, First Class Realty, you'll see some of the videos I've done for him where he does, uh, you know, he tells his tenants, um, you know, what's an emergency, what's a non-emergency? <laughs> um, you know, and, and then how to put in that emergency request or how to put in that maintenance request. Mm -hmm. um, we've done 10 to start and uh, just kind of see how it goes, but it's just really good information. So if somebody has a question, uh, somebody else had a good idea. They said, why don't you just go through your whole FAQ list and do a video on each one? And, yep. you know, stuff like that. You guys have really helped me see the light of the videos of the, you know, how, how much Google is valuing those and everything mm -hmm. there. And, uh, but yeah, check that out. Check out the Bad Tenant Blues. Leave us a comment. <laughs> I love it. Jason, this, this has been a great episode. So how do we find you again? So we can talk to Bad Tenant Blues. You bet. Uh, is there AccuTrack? It's got a website, right? We do. It's www.accutrack.com. Um, so A-C-U-T-R-A-Q. Um, you can also reach us at info at AccuTrack.com. That is I-N-F-O at A-C-U-T-R-A-Q.com. And I uh, really appreciate you having me on. This has been so much fun. And I know every guest you have, you could go on for days on these topics. I know. So. It. We, get, we get going on certain <laughs> things and keep talking. But, Jason, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. Thank Take care. Thank you, Brad.